Okay, with that, uh, I want to let the floor over to uh, Ellie to. Uh, I'll, 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 thank you. Th thank you very much for coming. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Don't know if we can really see this, but I think we're fine. Uh, okay, maybe you can see it. Uh, well, I don't think it's displaying. Um, <coughs> no. Um, it's been one minute. See if I get this thing working. If not, we'll, uh, we'll go without it. Um, <laughs> coming. Uh, there we go. Uh, you can see the slides ahead because I guess when I, for some reason when I make it into a slideshow it causes problems. I'll just leave it like this. Uh, it's fine. Um, so my name is Ellie Cole. I am a uh, U.S. CPA. I uh, made sure they publicize clearly that I'm a U.S. accountant, not an Israeli accountant. Um, I work uh, at Cole and Waxman Tax Services. I'm a partner there. We specialize in U.S. tax filing for mostly people that uh, live in Israel or Israelis uh, living in America or Americans that have Israeli real estate, different different types of people, but very much familiar with everyone, I think, in most of your situations. Um, our, our, our firm is based in Jerusalem. We have about uh, 20 uh, employees, mostly accountants, that work with us. Uh, we do have an Israeli accounting firm. Uh, it's an affiliate accounting firm of ours. Um, I'll, at the end, I'll get all my contact information. Anyone can email me. I can send you, uh, you know, any questions you have, I can send you by email. Um, I can send an introduction to the Israeli accountant. So I can answer um, a lot of questions about Israeli tax. I am going to talk about Israeli tax as well as American tax because obviously it's very related and it's important to understand both. Uh, there are some levels of Israel tax I cannot advise on. At that point, we have to bring in the Israeli accountant for you know, crunching numbers or giving more technical points. But uh, we will cover some Israel tax, uh, but my focus is U.S. tax. I'm a U.S. CPA. I'm not an Israeli CPA. Uh, but again, our office can work together with you if you want a one-stop shop to handle your U.S. and Israel things and not have me ask you one thing and then the Israeli accountant ask you something else. and back and forth, you know, the Israeli accountant sits in our office once a week. We have a couple hundred shared clients that we work on together. So we work as one, even though we are two separate uh, companies. Um, and uh, so yeah, we handle, you know, mostly accounting stuff. Uh, originally I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I went to University of Maryland and then I worked at Ernst & Young in New York for about five years or so. Um, then about 12 years ago, um, I made Aliyah originally to uh, from Jerusalem briefly, then I went, uh, moved to Beersheba, I lived there for a year, I got my MBA at Ben Gurion, then I moved up to Haifa, I spent a year working at General Electric uh, as an accountant. Uh, while I was at GE, I was also starting my own accounting practice that I had been having since I got to Israel, but that really started growing. Um, so after about a year in Haifa, I uh, joined with uh, my partner David Waxman, he started the firm about 20 years earlier. Uh, and now we're partners together. The firm is based in Jerusalem. I had lived in Jerusalem for about seven years before moving to Modi'in two years ago. I lived there with my wife and three children. Uh, so, what I talk about tax is gonna address, I think I'm gonna focus a lot on the uh, Atzma'i question or the question about what about when you uh, are working for a US company or for uh, you know, US clients or in Israel as an independent. There seems like a lot of uh, questions about that, uh, as well as the 10-year exemption, things like that we'll get into. Um, but we'll start off talking about uh, kind of U.S. tax, uh, kind of your question almost like, like why, what, really this is your question, is like, you know, how dare they, why, et cetera, um, then to understand a little bit what Israel does, because uh, we've got U.S. and then Israel, um, and then kind of go into some specific technical things. Um, I want this to be interactive, so at any point, cut me off, or just raise your hand instead of cutting me off, that's why I prefer it, but <laughs> jump in at any time you have a question, raise your hand, um, I'll either write it down and get to it later, or answer your questions, so feel free to jump in at any time, uh, I want to, you know, address whatever questions you guys have. Um, and we'll start with 
Elon's question, I guess, which is which is the why, uh, probably everybody's question. Uh, and in some ways, the answer doesn't matter. I could just tell you, well, that's the law. And ultimately, you know, I don't make the laws. You don't make the laws where they are what they are, and you have to do it. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, the U.S. Uh, is one of the only countries in the world that has what's called a citizenship-based taxation system. So. Most countries have a residence-based taxation. So if you originally are from Italy and you move from Italy to Israel and you don't have any uh, property or any money left in Italy, you keep your Italian citizenship. If you wanna travel there, great. If you wanna be an Italian citizen, great. You don't file any taxes because you have nothing to do with Italy. You're living in Israel. America says, we don't care. If you're a US citizen, if you have the um, the merit to be a U.S. citizen or the burden to be a U.S. citizen, depending how you look at it, it doesn't matter. If you are a U.S. citizen, you have U.S. tax obligations. That's the law. It's very clear. There's no question about it at this point. Years ago, people would argue it. It's, I think everyone understands legally, um, whether it's unconstitutional or challenging the courts is a different story, but the law is very clear. It is uh, uh, a law going way back, actually, uh, uh, the reason why they did it, if out of curiosity, if you care, is that it used to be when the country was being formed, um, I forget what year it was, what, not when formed, but it, there was a point in time when uh, a lot, most of the wealthy landowners in America actually lived in Europe. And so when the wars were starting, America needed money. The people that were actually living in America had no money. The people that owned the land and said, we're one day gonna have this land had all the money. So they started taxing um, kind of anyone that had some kind of claim. This is 200 uh, years ago. This was years ago. Then they actually stopped that law. And then um, around the Civil War, they needed money and they reimposed the law. And they said, if you are going to be a citizen, and enjoy the benefits that U.S. citizenship brings you, we're gonna tax you no matter what, or you're gonna have to report no matter what. If you don't like it, don't be a citizen. Simple. It's not also simple necessarily at this point, I'd like to give up the citizenship, we'll get into that. But they just say that's the law. If you wanna be our citizen, and people have seen there are benefits to being a citizen, there are costs to it, right? People for travel, scholarships, you know, tuition, education opportunities, COVID stimulus, kid payments, there are benefits to it. There are costs to it. It's something everyone has to decide for themselves. And there's non-tax reasons as well that people should decide. Um, but as long as you're a citizen, uh, you have a burden, which is you have to report to the US on your worldwide income, not just your US income, but any income you have in the world needs to be reported to the US. We'll get into the treaties, the tax laws, the laws that in theory try to prevent double taxation, try to prevent um, overly burdening people. Doesn't always work that way. In some cases, people fall into these tax traps where they uh, have a big extra cost. Uh, but there's, uh, and again, there's some things we can do, some things we can't do, but you need to report your worldwide income to the United States as long as you are a US citizen make it a little worse. Not only do you have to report all of your income, uh, but we have what's called the FBAR, which I think a lot of people here have probably heard of by now, the Foreign Bank Account Report, or FATCA, Form 8938, which the US says, not only do we wanna know all of the income you have every year, we also wanna know all of the money you have in the world. Um, really all the money you have outside of the United States. If you have, uh, you know, a brokerage account with Morgan Stanley, you don't have to tell us about it because Morgan Stanley tells us about it. We can control the money you have in the US, so we don't care about that. But if you have a bank account with Bank of Pauline, you have a pension with Menorah Insurance, insurance you have a Kubot Gemma with Metab Dash, they don't know about these funds. Uh, we want to know about it. So you have to file a separate report, which in many ways is incredibly easy. It's not a complicated form to do. If you have a lot of accounts, it's a pain to track down all the numbers, but you don't necessarily need an accountant. Some people have us do it. Some people do it themselves. I 
send people instructions if they want to do it themselves. If not, we do it. It's like $100 for the form. It's not the most complicated tax thing out there. There's no tax due. You're just disclosing all your information. So it's in some ways really not a big deal. In other ways, it's a huge deal because people don't like the fact that the U.S. knows all the information about them. But the U.S. wants to know all the information about you, so it kind of goes both ways. Um, obviously, it makes people scared because if they're not reporting everything to the U.S., you know, let's say you report to the U.S. that you have $6 million in a Bank of Paul Lima account. Well, what, what are the, you know, if you report high income every year or you reported a large inheritance or a large investment, then you made money, so that makes sense. You have the money in there, it makes sense. But if you've never reported anything before, that obviously could raise a red flag, kind of, well, why do you have so much money here? And if you have so much money in an account, the U.S. would usually expect that on your tax return, you should have investment income, right? If you have millions of dollars in a Israeli brokerage account, it's likely that you'll have significant amounts of interest, dividends, capital gains. So it's kind of the F bar is in some ways a very simple form that you don't have to think much about, and especially if your financial situation it's pretty basic, just like a checking account and some pensions. It's, you don't have to really think about it. If you have more going on, um, I mean, hopefully you're doing everything kosher, so it's fine. But if you're not, it's something you have to be careful about because it, it is something that it's a legal form more than a tax form, but it's something used uh, for compliance purposes. And it's a very big tool that the U.S. government has to force people to be compliant. Right? You say, what's the worst that could happen? Yes, from the Israel side, from the U.S. side as well. But one of the big concerns, if you're not compliant, um, the U.S. can punish you a lot more for not filing an FBAR than they could punish you for not filing a tax return. The punishment for not filing a tax return, especially if you don't owe tax, depending on your situation. If it's a pretty basic, so you have a basic Israeli salary, no complicated informational forms, no tax due, there's not really any penalties for not filing a tax return. I mean, they'll send you something, you'll have to prepare the return, send notices, but um, Unless they say there's fraud and they're going to take you to court, but generally speaking, if you have no tax due, it's hard to show there was fraud because you just were being lazy by not filing or you just weren't filing. But uh, uh, but the F bar uh, has much more significant penalties, and they can use this to really track people down a lot more and make things a lot worse because it's 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 not from a legal perspective, it's not as big of a deal to. Uh, to, to not file a tax return in most cases than it is to not file an FBAR. Uh, so the FBAR is really important to file. It gets you on the radar and you have to see things. The, the FBAR is something that, um, it's been around since the 70s. Uh, it was something, uh, it, it was, it's something that the US used a lot to track down. I think it's what actually what put Al Capone in jail. They tracked down a lot of the mafia members by saying, well, we can't prove your crimes. We can't even prove that you're not reporting income on your tax return, even though we know you're not. But you've got $20 million sitting in a Swiss bank account that you never told us about. We see this as your account. And instead of us going after you for not reporting all this income, we're just going to say it's a violation of the FBAR. You have $20 million sitting in an offshore bank account. You never disclosed it to us. That's illegal. The U.S. government kind of for, I was they forgot about the FBAR. They chose not to really focus on it for a large period of time. It used to be only criminal. Um, they used it a lot uh, after September 11th to catch some of the terrorist activities that went on to fund 9-11, to fund other terrorist activities. They were using the FBAR, they were again saying to these terrorist terrorists that they couldn't prove the terrorist activities, but they could prove that millions of dollars were being funneled in foreign bank accounts. And there was US citizens that owned some of them. So they could go after that, so it was a tool they used. And then what happened about, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is the US government said, the FBAR is something that we're not just gonna be implementing from a criminal standpoint, but also from a civil standpoint. So we're not just going after terrorists and uh, you know crime bosses, we're going after this, the ordinary person. And I've got you know various clients who, I mean, probably, you know, people who, you know, a grandparents, you know, got, you know, uh, had a million dollars in a Swiss bank account that was just inherited by somebody. They don't even like think about the money, it just sits there, they're like, it'll be my family wealth down the road, it's gonna be some, you know, but the money's growing and they're not telling the US government about it. And it's an offshore bank account that they're not disclosing. And there are huge penalties um, and there's huge enforcement on this. So I think what, what has happened is the US government put a huge emphasis on this, uh, on this FBAR, which in turn kind of 
increase the enforcement on U.S. tax reporting, which is why for people that have been here for 20 years, I'm sure they realized about seven, eight years ago, <laughs> there started to be a lot more talk about U.S. tax reporting that's increased over the past period of time. I think now it's plateaued. People still talk about it, but not increasing. But this this was the trigger to like U.S. tax enforcement. Uh, let's say someone just heard you said and said, oh, I have a million dollars in an offshore bank account I've been reporting. What do I do? Not me. Someone else with lots of money in an offshore bank account. What would they do? Sure. So in our first conversation, I probably would stop them early on and say, if you've got a million dollars, certainly in a Swiss bank account, that's earning money that's never been reported. At this point, you got to bring in a lawyer from day one. you got to talk to an attorney. Uh, there is a... There is not the the attorney the attorney client um, privilege is a higher level than the accountant client privilege. So uh, if I get subpoenaed, I have to share a document on my clients, whereas an attorney does not. So at that level, uh, at this point, that see the problem is five or six years ago, I'd have a different answer. I'd say, okay, great. There's you know some kind of program. We'll get them in. We'll crunch the numbers. We'll file the reports. We'll get them. We'll get them out. Now. And again, you give an extreme example. You're saying about a million dollars in a Swiss bank account. You kind of got to bring an attorney and figure out how to make sure things can be handled the best way possible. If you give me a different example of, well, what if somebody has $100,000 $100, in a Bank of Paulim account, which is just modest investments. So there, I wouldn't bring in the attorney. I'd say, well, let's talk with them. We'll set the expectations. We'll go over the options. Like Are that, they understanding if like, oh. you just were like, kind of negligent and not paying and not paying attention? Potentially if depends. You, the, 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 there's a lot of questions to go into. What is your profession? What is your background? It's, uh, look, there are some people, it's, it's harder and harder to, to claim, I, I didn't know. Five years ago was much easier. But there are some people who honestly didn't know they were US citizens. They just found out, oh, I didn't even realize. It turns out I'm a US citizen. So now I have to report everything. It really is a legitimate position. So if, if you have reasonable cause, there is a little more understanding. Uh, it's getting harder to show reasonable cause, but it's something we look into. Um, specifically, the Swiss bank accounts are more complicated because there are certain, and most of them are Swiss ones, there are certain banks that have already signed an agreement with the IRS to share information. So the US government is much stricter about those banks because they're like, we're going to catch you anyways. So it's almost too late to come forward. If you do, it has to be done in a certain way. So it's an Israeli bank, or it depends on what bank it is here, it might not be as uh, uh, legally problematic to get caught up. If I was trying to hide money, I'd go into crypto and tell Ledger and pass that Ledger around in the United States. There's no way of knowing about it. How do they combat that? Because like today we all work with dollars, banks, everything's digital. We're just throwing in a little hard drive with a small password. They can never find out about that. Like, so, where that goes out to. so crypto is obviously very new and there's the compliance of it is still not uh, finalized. It has so far been agreed that crypto does not fall under um, a financial account that has to be reported on the FBAR. So you're, you don't have to report crypto on an FBAR, um, but they can change that. You also do, you do not have to report real estate on the FBAR. So FBAR is foreign um, financial accounts. Um, I have one client that actually really did not want to report the FBAR. He bought a boat just because he wanted to get a lot of cash. I was like, I don't want to report this to the bank. I'm going to buy a boat. I don't have to report that. I don't have to, buy a, I don't have to report a boat ownership to anybody. So that's what mm -hmm. I'm going to do. Um, the, uh, so, so crypto, again, I don't know. I'm not going to advise you as far as how to hide the money. And I, I would be very surprised if down the road there's not uh, better enforcement uh, of, of disclosing crypto. I imagine it's a legal question of how they're going to be able to do it. Um, but uh, yeah, short term for now. And, and you do, you are required on, on, on a US tax return. They ask, do you hold crypto? Do you trade crypto? You do have to disclose that you have crypto. They don't say how much, but you do need to note whether you have crypto or not. So it's something that's getting out there and I wouldn't, and when you sell it, it's required to you know, uh, report. Um, so, so that's the US um, where you have all that. Then <clears throat> we have problem number two, which is Israel, because you're a US citizen uh, so the U.S. has a citizenship-based taxation system, so you have to report to the U.S. and you have to pay to the U.S. potentially. Next, Israel, for the most part, has a residence-based taxation system, like most countries. Israel is a little bit weird because we too often me, they charge you 
some even if you're not an Israeli resident, but let's put that issue aside. For the most part, Israel is mostly, well, if you're an Israeli resident, you have to pay Israeli tax. So we have an issue where you're a U.S. citizen living in Israel, so you're a, uh, you have to pay U.S., you have to report U.S. tax because you're a U.S. citizen, but you're an Israeli resident, so you, have to, you also have to pay Israeli tax. That is the crux of our problem here, I think. People that live in the U.S. are like, okay, I have to pay U.S. tax. People complain about it all the time, but it's like, okay, at least I'm living in the U.S. I mean, says I pay the tax in the U.S. It is what it is. By the way, I mean, we've got our California resident here. They complain because uh, on top of paying the IRS, whatever you pay them, you pay California another 12% potentially or whatever, 15%. It's crazy. So it's, you know, there's actually people in America who complain all the time about taxes. People in Israel that are not American citizens complain about how high Israeli taxes could be. So everyone complains about taxes, but now if you're in two tax systems, it's potentially even more significant because you have two tax systems to be concerned about and, <clears throat> and aware of. So the first step we have is compliance, um, which is just a bunch of tax reporting. I mean, if, if it's kind of best case scenario is the only thing you have to worry about is accounting fees, no extra tax. Uh, which is still annoying. You still have to file the, t you, like if, let's say you're living in Israel, uh, you have nothing, all, all you have is just a simple, you have a job in Israel, no other income from anywhere else. So you're an employee, you get a tofes mevashish, you get an income, you get a tax form uh, as an Israeli employee, no other income. Uh, actually, Israel will typically withhold the right amount of tax for you. So you do not have to pay you don't, uh, you don't even have to file an Israeli tax return. Um, actually, I read somewhere that 80% of Israelis do not file a tax return. <laughs> Israelis are often shocked when they hear that you have to file a tax return because you work, you're an employee, they withhold whatever they should. Yeah. If you have some interest or dividends in the bank, pretty much the tax on that individual is 25%. So if you have uh, $1,000 of interest, they'll withhold $250 and just give you the rest and there's nothing to file. If, I think maybe the yes, the question's not here, but if, if you give charity, uh, as an example, uh, you can file a tax return, it's a simple report, you can possibly do it themselves, uh, you can you disclose the charity you gave to Israel and get a bit of a refund, because there's a refund for giving charity to Israel. Uh, if you have two jobs, then the withholding's probably not correct and you'll have to file an Israeli tax return. If you're independent, you obviously have to file a tax return. If you have U.S. investments or any other sorts of income that uh, Israel wouldn't know about, that if it's U.S. investments after the 10 years as a Lachadash, you'll have to file an Israeli tax return. But if you're just a simple situation, you don't have to file an Israeli tax return. However, on the U.S. side, our example of someone that's just, I don't know, working for Mr. Arachinuch as a teacher, they make uh, 100,000 shekels a year. Uh, on, on, the, on the Israel <laughs> side, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they don't file anything to Israel. On the U.S. side, they still have tax reporting to do. Uh, they'll have to file a U.S. tax return and say, hey, I earned 100000 I earned $30,000 for the year. 99.9% .9 they don't owe any tax to the U.S. Potentially, there'll be some refunds, maybe not, but it's a disclosure reporting, simple report, this is what I earned. I'm not getting into the technical reasons why, but typically, I shall get to the reasons why soon, typically, they won't have to pay any tax to the U.S. Um, and just a tax return. Then they also have to file an FBAR, say this is how much money is in my bank account, <clears throat> this is how much money is in my Israeli pension, Israeli carry national mode, just to disclose everything they have to the uh, 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 to the U.S. government. So <coughs> that's best case scenario was just compliance filing a lot of documents. Um, if you have somebody in that scenario, teacher, whatever, here only works here, lives here, has somebody, <coughs> like maybe visits the U.S. but has no dealings in the U.S. and they haven't dealt with taxes, like they left the U.S. and they're like the last 20 years are here just working here and they're like, yeah, I didn't really know how to deal with my U.S. stuff so it hasn't done anything. Sure. At this point, um, do they just get an account and figure out what to do? And yeah, get an account and figure out what to do. Uh, and also if they're of like retirement age where they could actually receive Social Security or something like that, can they like clean up the last 20 years, get in good standing? <laughs> <laughs> well, the only, so, so. You can only go back, as far as cleaning up to like pay into social security or something, the statutes are three years. So, so typically, kind of to clean somebody up, everyone's situation is a little bit different, I'll talk to them, but uh, typically you go back between three and six years on the tax return FBARs to get them up to date. Okay. Uh, 
Also, like, you should go back between three to six years. There's ways to enter kind of a formal streamlined filing, enter compliance in the proper way, which we prefer to do. Although, it costs more money. The other option, which is not my preferred way, but it's better than nothing is, so file 2021 or file 2022, at least start filing. It's right. better to go back. It's better to do things the right way. But at the end of the day, your risk probably isn't, if, if the main reason you're not filing is you're like, well, look, I gotta go back six years. I got I don't have 6,000 checkouts to pay an accountant to do all my reports, but I can pay them, you know, 1,000, 1,500 checkouts for one year and going yep. forward file it every year. That's your choice and we can get you, it's better than nothing to get into the system. And it's probably not so bad right now to catch up with the filings because there is a few COVID stimuluses. So they'll probably get a little bit of money back for 2021 and 2020 that at least helps cover the cost of the whole process. Not that it's guaranteed, not that they will, but typically right now is a pretty decent time to get caught up if you never had before because you have a little bit of that helping you out. Um, so we have two grown kids who made Aliyah. Their only assets in the States are some investment accounts, you know, gets bought for them when they were born, we were growing up. You know, they don't monitor them as cash sitting in the States. Do they have to file in the U.S.? Sure, they're working in Israel. Yeah, they live here. They're Absolutely. They, they have to file a U.S. tax return disclosing the income that they earn in Israel and hope they don't owe any tax. Again, we'll get into, if they're Atzimaim, it's a big problem. We'll get into yeah, that. Yeah, but, yeah. but. They, they certainly, it's, it's important to, they have to file every year. Best case scenario, it's a really simple situation. It's a simple reporting. But there are complications. We also have to keep in mind that could change as life gets more complicated. It's definitely better to get ahead of the curve and be prepared for things uh, ahead of time to get people, you know, caught up with their filing. Um, either to say start doing it and do it going forward or to preferably enter the, the uh, do it in a proper way going back a few years. And again, there is a good chance they'd be eligible for some COVID uh, stimulus money to help cover the costs of the, the process as well. So is it, uh, are we as Americans able to apply for COVID stimulus? Because we never received one single check going back to 2020. The only person in my family that ever got it was my son who was serving as a lone soldier here in Israel. Did you He's file, the only one that ever did got you, a check. Did you file a US tax return? Yeah, uh, every so it, year. It, either, either your income is too high, that wouldn't make you eligible for it, which is possible, we're not gonna, get into that um or if you were eligible and you didn't receive it there's a way to claim it on your 2020 and 2021 tax returns so either it, it would be a weird thing to no, no, I, I would imagine either the income is too high so you weren't eligible right. or it's something that the software would do even if you're doing your own tax return right. the software would do it for you right. um so it'd be surprised i'd be surprised if you missed that okay. um it's also possible that you have tax due for other reasons and you had a little bit of the refund that just offset the tax due you didn't even really notice it so right. also so and just a real quick follow-up about the kids that have investment accounts in, in, the, in the States. So they're U.S. citizens, even if they took that money out of the States and, and put it in an, Israel, an Israeli investment account, they would still be required to file taxes in the States just because they're citizens. Correct, correct. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Specifically about my situation, I'm supposed to fly to the United States after the holidays. Flown back before, obviously. But the question is, do I have? I'm going to the United States, and I'm going to be there for six days. Do I have what to fear? And the second part of my question is, if even if I were to start filing today, tomorrow, would would that process be done by the time I fly out? Is there something here that I need to be worried about? Sure. So, in theory, if it was critical, we could probably get it done in six days. I've done it in 24 hours. I've done. I've done six years worth of returns for somebody in 24 hours that needed it for a green card process. Yeah. Obviously it's more cost, it's, it's a headache, I'd rather not do it, but it's possible to get things done quickly. You know, uh, if they, you know, arrest you at, at the airport, you'll give me a call, we'll get it done within, you know, as fast as we can. Not getting um, you'd also, uh, you'd be the first person that I've ever heard of to get arrested in that situation. They're, 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 I, I believe the situations where people have been held at the airports, typically it means that the IRS has already opened up a tax claim on them. It's not, I, I know that. What's you that? Would, you wouldn't know that. No, um, it's unlikely. Um, in most people's situations, it would, it's more likely to have happened if, let's say you, without realizing, 
uh, had a U.S. brokerage account and they were like stock sales that made money. You didn't realize it. Let's say like, you know, someone's parents are kind of controlling their brokerage account without filing taxes. And, so, like, and so something happens. There gets to be tax due. Um, you owe money. You didn't really realize it. For some reason, the IRS chooses to kind of like escalate that and they flag you. It's very unlikely at this point. There is a fear that at some point it could turn away people. Like it's, uh, if you look in your U.S. passport, the last page, it says U.S. citizens are required to file taxes, to report worldwide income. It's there because if they want to stop you, they can show you, you are not eligible to enter. That's some more lawyers. I'm not getting into this conversation. I'm not going to tell you you're fine. I would be surprised, uh, but I can't say it's not going to happen. As far as Israel compliance goes, I really don't, I'm not an Israeli attorney. I know that uh, I would be more scared about Israel than America, tax authorities. I know that Israel, a couple years ago, were sending a lot of notices out to people uh, just blindly and kind of saying like, hey, like prove to us you don't have to file taxes. And like, Israel tax authorities are kind of scared. Uh, so I would be, I would be nervous about that. Uh, can't be. Scary than Harris. Yeah. I would be more. I would be more scared than Hassan than the other for non-filing. Um, so, uh, so I think the biggest thing that people kind of, when it comes down to it, the compliance side reporting is annoying, right? You mentioned you got a couple of kids, and all of a sudden they realize every year we have to cut a check to the accountant or spend the time to figure out how to file taxes ourselves. It's annoying. Best case scenario. <laughs> it's annoying and it's just something just like you have to go to the dentist every year to clean your teeth is annoying and if you don't it's gonna cause other problems so you gotta go to your accountant every year it's an annoying thing to do um the bigger issue is when it's more than just a uh, a task that needs to get done but it's when you actually have to pay tax i think that's when people start to get um even more uh turned off or scared about filing taxes um so as i mentioned there's a lot of cases um in most cases, people do not have to pay tax to the U.S. Um, and there's, uh, and then in a lot of cases, you also don't have to pay kind of double tax to Israel. Um, there's a few tools that are used in each country. Um, <clears throat> the first is something called the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion, where the U.S. says essentially the first hundred plus thousand dollars of earned income you earn, um, you'd be taking exclusion to not have to pay tax uh, to the U.S. on it. So if you're living and working in Israel earning a salary of $100,000. For your tax return, you can say, I earned $100,000, I choose to take the 2555 and exclude the $100,000 from being taxable. I don't have to pay the U.S. any tax. Only if it's made in Israel. Correct, or outside of the U.S. Um, this, the second thing we use is the foreign tax credit, which is, we kind of say, you earn $100,000. If you're in the U.S., you have to pay the U.S. $15,000. You already paid Israel $25,000. So we take a tax credit, we pay 25, which is more than 15. So we say we usually would owe 15,000. We already paid more than 15,000 to the US, sorry, to Israel. So we do not owe the US any money. So both of these work in most cases for basic salaries to get you out of paying any income tax on your Israel salary. 2555 is a huge thing we do for people who live in, uh, <coughs> in Switzerland or in some other countries which have very low income taxes, because in, in the Switzerland, if you're earning $100,000, your tax is only like 5,000 bucks, so you'd have a huge bill to the US, so we need to use the 2555. So. In, is, in Israel, the tax rates are so high in Israel for most people. There are some exceptions for people that live in spots, having a huge number of children that aren't American, that get the benefit from Israel, but not from America. There are some exceptions where people have higher tax to the US than to Israel on their salary, but the vast majority of people living and working in Israel have higher tax to Israel than they would have in America. So we usually use the uh, foreign tax credit, not the exclusion. The problem is for both of these things, this only helps us with income tax. It does not help us with social security tax, which we're gonna get into in a few minutes for all the other money in here we'll talk about. So if I understand correctly from what you're saying, if I have most of my income is here in Israel, but I have one account in the United States, stocks, not me of course, some of these, stocks from when I was in, a, from my bar mitzvah money that my mother's been handling for I don't know how many years, that in any case I will have to report separately, is that's not included in my, in, in my, in, in this exclusion, I can't. Correct, you cannot put in the exclusion, 
your investment accounts, if you have rental properties, if you have an Israeli rental property, you can't exclude that. Um, but you could take the 116, if you have an Israeli rental property, you're potentially paying Israeli tax. Well, then you calculate what the US tax would be, subtract the Israel tax you've already paid. Um, and other, this is only for earned income, so well, same thing, uh, uh, severance pay, unemployment, maternity leave, any types of other income. Uh, now, if you do have the investment account, though, you'll, well, we'll get to it, because you, you have to report that to Israel, Israel as well, as well yeah. which, so, um, the, the, third thing on the, U, the third thing on the U.S. side is the, uh, the, the, the treaty position, Form 8833. Um, there are certain types of income which are addressed in the U.S. Israel tax treaty and uh, are just exempt from, uh, from having to pay tax. So uh, the big example of this is U.S. Social Security benefits. If, you're, uh, if you had worked and you paid it enough and you are eligible for Social Security benefits and you're living in Israel receiving U.S. Social Security benefits, those are actually tax-free. Um, so in some cases, I think somebody set out with mentioning that they, uh, you know, a retiree here, they're scared after their 10 years, their tax will go up a lot. In some cases for retirees, people that retire to Israel, it's possible your tax will go down, not just for the first 10 years, but forever. That depending on what your income is, a lot of cases retirees have lower tax because even after the 10 years, pensions are taxed pretty favorably by Israel. You don't pay more tax to Israel on a US pension than you'd have to pay to the US. If you got capital gains, interest, dividends, Israel might tax it a little bit higher than the US would have taxed it. But you get out of social security benefits and the bottom line, and you get out of state tax, you know, if you're living in California. So it, it, it in many cases, a retiree, especially from California or New York, um, will end up having lower tax as a retiree in Israel than they would uh, if they stayed in America because of the treaty for excluding uh, social security benefits. Um, <clears throat> on the Israel side, as far as reducing tax goes, there's a few tools as well. Um, number one is Nikuyim, which are uh, kind of like deductions. Again, more kids, or if you live uh, up north, down south, you sometimes get uh, uh, some people that have uh, disabilities. You can have Nikuyim where you pay a little bit less tax because your tax uh, tax is a bit lower. Um, Zikuyim are credits, and this is uh, this is really important. This is the this is the concept of no double taxation, and this works really clean when it comes to income tax on earned income. So. When we have people, I think a few people mentioned that they work for U.S. companies, they do most of their work here, but maybe travel back to the U.S. The concept is on the income tax level, it's, it's pretty fair, where if the money's earned in Israel and Israel taxes it, so you get a credit on the U.S. side to not pay, yeah, not pay double tax to the U.S. If the U.S. for some reason gets to tax your income first, Israel will give you a credit to not have to pay double tax. So you kind of get hit with the higher tax between the two countries, but you don't pay tax twice. So let me give an example. Let's say you have, uh, let's say you are working in Israel. Uh, let's say you earn, uh, or I should say you're working in America. Let's say you're past your 10 years in Aleph Hadash, but you're uh, an ER doctor that you fly back to Israel, you fly back to the States one week a month, do all your work there. So you earn for the year uh, $200,000 uh, and you did all the work in America. Um, let's just say that America, and there's tiebreaker rules for kind of who taxes you first, but let's say America taxes you, for, let's say in this case that America, if they would tax you first, so you'll pay your 25% tax to America then you turn around to Israel and Israel says, okay, well you would owe us 40% tax. You already paid 25% to America, so give us the extra 15% tax. You don't pay double tax, you just pay the tax up to the higher rate between the two countries. The flip side, if you were in the full 200,000 in Israel, and Israel has, gets to tax you first, so Israel would say, great, pay us 40%. You'll pay them their 40%. Then you'll file to the U.S. and the U.S. says you owe us 25%. <coughs> you already paid 40% to Israel, so you don't owe us anything because you get the credit. So you're not paying double tax because the two countries recognize the tax you paid to the other ones on the income tax side. So that's the same thing when it comes to investments. If you have, if you're living in Israel, and you have a U.S. brokerage account. So you have $10,000 of dividends in your U.S. brokerage account. You file your U.S. tax return. You pay 15% tax on your U.S. dividends, you then report to Israel. Israel says, okay, our tax rate is 25%. You already paid 15% to the U.S., so give us the extra 
that's the way they kind of look at it together. I have a question on Social Security. From, to my understanding, so when you owe Social Security, it's kind of non-negotiable. In other words, it's a certain. It's you know, can I just hold up? I'm going to get. I'm going to finish a few more points, and we're going to jump into us my own Social Security. If that's okay. So, uh, the last thing on the Israel side, which it seems like is relevant for a chunk of people here, is the 10-year exemption. You make Aliyah, and you get a 10-year tax exemption. Where for 10 years, you do not have to um, report or pay tax to Israel on any of your non-Israeli sourced income. Now this is a really big deal because there people don't always fully understand what this 10-year exemption is. Sometimes people hear that and they think, great, I'm not going to think about Israel taxes for the first 10 years. Um, and in most cases, that's not accurate. Um, the biggest reason why is, um, so let's say, I think some people mentioned it. The 10-year exemption, what it refers to, so first of all, it refers to passive income. So if you have U.S. rental income, U.S. dividends, interest, partnership income, that's completely exempt for 10 years, and that you're totally good with for 10 years. You know, you have to remember, at some point, those 10 years end, and we have to plan for that, usually a couple years before the end of the 10 years, to look at what it's going to look like. But if your income is mostly passive, you're usually pretty, pretty good. However, if you have earned income, if you're working, the it's only exempt income if you are physically outside of Israel when you do the work. So if you're a surgeon and you're legitimately you fly to the states for one week, one one week a month, you perform surgeries. Your salary is pretty much 100% for the work you're doing as a surgeon. You're back in Israel for three weeks doing whatever you like to do. Your income is really exempt. For most jobs these days, with the way technology is. If you're living in Israel, you're typically doing work in Israel as well. Um, so let's say you have a U.S. bank account, you have a U.S. client that's paying directly to your U.S. bank account, but you're doing all of your work in Israel and you're physically in Israel, you have to pay tax to Israel on all of your income. Everything that you earn in Israel needs to be reported to Israel. So that's 100%. It gets complicated and we can bring in, again, this is where the Israeli accountant that we work with specializes in the judgment calls because it's not always black and white. What about the person who spends, you know, 45 days a year in the States, but they spend during those 45 days, they're having their high level meetings. They're doing like a lot of work. And when they're back in Israel for 80% of the year, they're doing less work. And how do you break down the income? That's a separate conversation. We'll get into that at another time. But what's important to understand is that Certainly, um, whatever income you derive from the work you're doing in Israel has to be reported. No, um, what is the income that you're earning from the U.S. company? Uh, you're already paying tax on in America. You're saying that you have social security difference? Actually, I'm saying that you have to first pay Israel. If let's say you let's say you're, you're a W-2, you're an employee, and, the, and your employer is withholding, they're, they're, they're giving you a paycheck, and they're holding out income tax. Doesn't matter. You first, you do the work in Israel, Israel gets to tax you first. You'll have to get the money back from the US. But if you're doing the work in Israel, Israel has first rights of taxing. So if you're doing the work in Israel for a US client, it's taxed in Israel? Correct. Correct. Unless Based you're on where the work is. Unless you're in, Unless the, US. in the US. Correct. So exactly. For the 10 year period, yes. Okay. It's, it's no different than, think about it this way if you were in, pretend that you're nothing to Israel, you were in the US. If you live in California, and you're doing all your work at your in your California home office, but your client lives in Florida. You can't say to California, "Oh, I'm not going to pay California tax." It's a you know, I've got a client that lives in Florida. I've got a Florida bank account, so I'm not going to pay state tax. It's where you are, which where you live, that, that that where you do the work. So basically, there is no tenure exemption for a self-employed person who makes aliyah and works in the states. It, who physically works it's in the states, but physically. Not, it's passive. It's if they are physically working in Israel, that is correct. And what if you're in what if the site's been two months in France? That's the same. So for those you will allocate the amount of money you earned in those two months will be exempt from Israel. Okay. The only state tax you want to, to deal with is California's tax. If you're from any other state in the United States, it's not an issue. No, incorrect. Most states have tax. I just gave the California example because he's from California. 
But this is, and when you have, do you have to report separately to, let's say, Wisconsin in my case? Or do I have to report if to you're, Wisconsin? Yeah, but, it, but, but states go by residence if you're living in that state. Yeah. Oh, there it is, residency. It's residence, not, federal. correct, correct. Right. If, if, oh. you're, if you're born in Wisconsin, but you yes. have no nothing. real estate there, nothing there, you just vote as a Wisconsin resident, you don't have to file a U.S. I mean, Wisconsin. Had every summer. That's not enough. I'm for the That's fine. So, <laughs> I'm back then. So I, I, we're from Pennsylvania, and you know, like, I have, a, I don't vote there. I don't really live there, but I have like an address. I use my brother's address to have certain things sent to us. But we have a traveling mailbox, which is in North Carolina. You know, for like, in short, you know, for the, sure. So, um, so how does that work? Are we on the hook for Pennsylvania state taxes? On no. No? You have no income source. You're, 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 sometimes the states get confused and you might get a notice from Pennsylvania like, hey, we saw your name on a lot of stuff. Are you a Pennsylvania resident? And then we just went back explaining, no, we have no income source. We, you, have, you, you have no income in Pennsylvania. Assuming you don't have like Pennsylvania real estate or anything. That, we have no real estate. I mean, our, our, our financial planner is in Pennsylvania, but no, our money is... You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to file it in yeah, Pennsylvania or yeah. yeah. North Carolina. Um, not anymore. That's right. So, That's actually what we're talking Yeah. I talking about the cost of ordering taxes and stuff. What about mom here in Israel? Do you know about that? Like if I have an American client or, or someone who pays me from the States uh, for business, do they pay the mom here in Israel or is it not paid at all? If they're in the U.S., I don't have to pay mom. Sure. Mom is not my area of expertise and I'm not really... Yeah, that's not my thing is, I don't really know, but I should answer, but I'm pretty confident if it's a, a U.S. client, um, there's not... Mom is the uh, like 17 I, I can, I can confirm that. I, I, have, I have some foreign customers um, I have never. No, if you, I, if they, if they're, I talk to my Israeli they're, 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 uh, Someone that lives outside of Israel is poor. My mom exempt from paying the, the mom, so you don't have to charge them. And both on me. Correct. No. They're really. Not you don't even people. report it. You don't. Um, it's not. You you you, you send them. You, you're in your tax invoice. It, there is no VAT whatsoever. Zero VAT. And then if anybody asks, then you tell your your Israeli accountant. Yes, this so, person. So so kind of the last thing just to to mention. I want to talk about a few of these cases. Is uh. There's, in a lot of ways, like I said, in a lot of cases, the tax situation is not so bad. In some cases, though, it is bad, and when it's bad, it's really bad. The things that we have to look out for, um, and there's a lot of things to look out for, but the kind of most common issues that we have, number one is atzma'i income, or if you're independent, or if you're working from a U.S., uh, from an Israeli company. The problem that we have is U.S. and Israel do not have what's called a totalization agreement. Uh, the U.S. has um, the, this agreement with a lot of other countries where they kind of say, uh, hey, if we have our citizen living in your country, um, we won't, if they're living in your country and pay, if, let's say if you're living in Italy and paying into, you know, Italy's national insurance and Italy's taxes, America says we won't, we won't, they're, they're out of social security because they're, they're near social security, they don't have to pay ours. But by the way, if the Italian is living in America, Italy won't charge them their version of Social Security, their national insurance. Israel and the U.S. do not have this agreement. For what it's worth, it's Israel's fault more than America's fault. Um, it doesn't really matter to us. We get hit with it, so we're screwed either way. Um, yeah. Israel, because of the way they apply Bituach Lumi to Israelis that move to America for a point of time, that violates the U.S.'s requirements to agree to a totalization agreement. So the two countries can't reach an agreement. And because of that, we all get screwed. And what it means is that in theory, anybody working in Israel, even though they're paying the two and they're paying into Israeli social security government, into Israeli's national insurance, they're still required to pay US social security tax, which is an extra 15%. There's an exception to this, which is that because the social security tax is actually an obligation on the employer, not the employee, if you have a foreign employer, in other words, if you're working for an Israeli company, then you're exempt from social security. So it's, it's not that you're screwed because you're not to me, it starts that everyone is screwed, but if you are work for an Israeli employer, an employee, you, 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 know, you get it. That's you, why we yeah. have the bomb. That's why somebody, so, so I'll get to that in a minute, but yes. Um, <laughs> um, but if you are atzmai, uh, if, you, if you do not have an Israeli employer, if you're working for a US company or if you're self-employed, then you are subject to U.S. Social Security tax, which is 15%, which sucks. There are, let me just jump to a few solutions to it, which 
I've got nothing groundbreaking. This is also I'm sure you've considered doing. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always work. The options are, um, number one, uh, have get paid by an Israeli employer. If you get paid by an Israeli employer, you save that 15% social security tax. How do you get paid by an Israeli employer? Number one is you make a chevrat ba'am. You make your own Israeli corporation and pay yourself a salary. Um, that's the cleanest and best way to do it. It's also the most expensive way to do it. A chevrat ba'am costs about you know, six thousand dollars a year or something like that. Plus or minus. Sure, because you, well, you have to make sure. Look, if you're making, uh, let's say you're making fifty thousand dollars a year as an atzmei, which is a great business, you're doing really well. You're paying fifteen percent to Social Security. You're paying seventy-five hundred dollars to Social Security. That's a huge amount. But is it worth spending six thousand dollars of accounting fees to save seventy-five hundred dollars of Social Security tax? Probably not. If it's a hundred thousand dollars, then probably yes. But you, you need to be making enough money as an me to justify the cost of having your own chevrat ba'am. If you can't, if it doesn't work for you to have your own chevrat ba'am, uh, sometimes people I've seen will kind of like find a, a friend or someone they know to kind of have a shared chevrat ba'am. That's not always the cleanest thing to do. It won't always work for everybody, but that's one thing to keep in mind because if you are a speech therapist and Matt's a physical therapist and you guys say to each other, hey, we're just making $50,000. What if we just like combine with an Israeli company and share it? It's an option that works for some people. It doesn't work for others. It's something to keep in mind. Another option is to, um, there are uh, payroll companies where you can, uh, they'll essentially make you their employees, so you run all your books through them. They're also pretty expensive. They're usually cheaper than having your own chavrat ba'am. You're talking about uh, the Yul Sakhir. Yul Sakhir. They uh, take a certain they cut take a from cut. the beginning and then... It's, it's an option. It's not great. None of these are great options. This is an Israeli company? Yeah, I could companies. send you their uh, information. Um, and uh, uh, so yeah, you're paying their fee. You're saving the social security tax. Um, another option is to uh, just embrace the social security tax. It sucks, <laughs> but I'll embrace uh, it, sir. <laughs> well, the, the way the way that I would look at it, um, you know, jokes aside, is, is it is pension. It's not the pension you want. It's and not, not taxable the, in either country. Correct. Now it's it's still not the best pension. You don't have control over it. It's it's got its flaws and uncertainty to it. But at the end of the day. It does it's, give you something. It's, it's something. It is going to be something. So that's why you say, would you rather have higher accounting fees or pay the social security tax? Everyone makes their decision. I'd rather pay the social security tax. Um, well, but it also sounds like it's easier. Like instead of going through not just the accounting fees, but the hassle of dealing with it, it's like, okay, you just pay the tax and you're done. But and potentially, you yeah. I mean, more. let's be honest. Look, depending on what the type of bots you have, being an me you still have hassles. I mean, I assume. Anyone who doesn't know Sigma or Shem, like it's, it's still a hassle to be an Atzmai, but uh, it it could be. And, and certainly, um, and this is, I think, kind of a bit out of scope for right now, but if, if you've got the U.S. income, and you, there, there are some other, if, if you've got income coming from like a U.S. LLC, there are some other options to structure things. There's sometimes ways that it's coming in through U.S. LLC to minimize Israeli pituach me. There's sometimes other ways it's coming in through U.S. LLC. Um, to make it an S corp, which may work and may not work in your situation. Uh, so there are options to minimize tax. It's kind of out of scope for right now, but there's things we could talk about. Um, what about making a founder member an employee? Well, first of all, that's not going to save you social security tax because it's bringing them an employee or are you running? They're still, it's, if you're making an Israeli corporation and pay an Israeli family member, that's one thing, but then you don't have to, like, you won't make them an employee won't solve your problem of social security tax. It might just be that they're in a lower tax bracket, but you have to make sure they're actually working for you, otherwise it's not legal just to pay a family member a salary. Um, just want to mention a few quick things, I'll take questions for a minute. Um, so then the, the other areas that people have to be aware of is um, rental income often causes a problem, especially Israel rental income, because for example, um, in Israel, if you're renting a property and rental income, what is it, you know, less than 5,500 shekels a month, you're a real estate expert, right? 5,500 is the number now. Well, if you make something like 5,500 shekels a month, you pay no tax to Israel on a rental property. America doesn't care. They'll charge you tax from the beginning. So it's 
It's possible that you'll get hit with, um, with tax to, to the U.S. on an Israeli rental property, even though if you're buying a property now, the beauty of rental properties in Israel is they don't make any money. Like, like what, when you <laughs> consider depreciation for what you pay and the mortgage interest, you're probably not making money um, on, your, on your rental. Um, Exactly, but talk to Siona if you have any questions about getting rental income. She's the real estate person here. Um, so uh, uh, the, bigger, the bigger issue than rental income is actually sale of a property, uh, especially if it's a property you've held for a long time. Israel gives a lot of exemptions uh, if you sell, uh, even if it's a rental property, if it's been owned for a long time, in a lot of cases, there won't be tax to Israel or there'll be minimal tax to Israel on selling a property. The U.S is a lot harsher. So uh, you think, yeah, so my e-tax is bad. Wait until your retirement age and you sell your $2 million home that you bought 60 years earlier for $100,000 and then you get slammed by US income tax on that when it doesn't tax you at all. There's some nasty situations when it comes to sale of properties. Um, there's also issues with, with pensions. Um, obviously Israel gives you some benefits with uh, carrying Shamut, different types of Karen Pensia, Kodiel Hashka'a, Israel's got different funds that they set up that have their own benefits. The U.S. does not recognize a lot of benefits that Israel recognizes, so you could get stuck in a tax trap there. And, uh, what about incurring it? Is there any tax in savings So there's, Israel does not have an inheritance tax. Um, the U.S. has an inheritance tax, but it's a very high exemption level, so most people don't have to pay, um, uh, most people don't pay tax on inheritance, um, but, in the U.S., you get a stepped-up basis. So if uh, you inherit, let's say somebody passed away and you inherit their property today, and it's worth, let's say somebody, somebody bought a property, a grandparent buys a property for $100,000, somebody, $100,000, you inherit it right now and it's worth $2 million, and you sell it a year later for $2.1 million, your tax is on the 2.1 minus 2 million. You have a stepped up basis of the value of the property when you inherit it. Um, uh, Israel does not do the stepped up basis, but they give you the tax benefit that the original person has. So there's usually not tax in Israel in that situation, but there could be. What are the approximate numbers with the inheritance tax where it starts to be? 11 million? If you're close, separate conversation. <laughs> Going back uh, to Social Security, does it... Actually, sorry to cut you off. Let me just finish the last, let me just do my last sure. bullet point and then we'll take questions. Sure. Um, the last thing to be aware of, which hasn't been mentioned yet here, but really important, is something called a PFIC, PFIC, Passive Foreign Investment Company. These are certain types of Israeli investments that cause a huge problem on the U.S. tax side. So specifically, uh, if anyone's invested in Israeli Kronot Nemanut or Tu Del Sol, pretty much if you have an Israeli brokerage account, and you're looking to start investing. Uh, actually, Kubot Gamashka is also a problem that's pretty common for people. They don't even let you open accounts. That's the beauty of it now. Uh, sometimes you can get your account open. Um, you have to make sure that you don't get into these certain funds because they cause a bit of a tax problem where, again, there's usually going to be extra tax to the U.S. side and also a lot of extra so that's just something to mention is if you're looking to invest Israeli money like in the market or Israeli brokerage accounts, there's other tax concerns to have as well. Okay, just throw my information up here so people can have it and I can take the question. Uh, about the Social Security, the 15% that you're talking about, is that from your gross or your net income after paying Israeli slash American taxes? It is gross profit. So you do not take a uh, deduction for the tax you pay to Israel. Uh, you get to write off your expenses. Um, you can write off. It's yeah, so it's at, it's net profit. So it's after it's revenue minus all your expenses. Oh, and somebody asked the question about how Israel doesn't give a lot of expenses. U.S. is a little more generous about expenses than Israel. So the big difference is a home office. So a lot of times we could take your dofer that I have said, we could add in your office expense if you have a home office. We could add in some of the rent there. We could add in some home office expenses to reduce your net profit. But then you pay the fifteen percent on that pre the tax. However, most Israeli accountants agree because the 15% tax you're paying is really 7.5% is for the employer, which is you, and 7.5% is for the employee. So the 7.5% for the employer will often be taken as a, um, 
as a deduction on the Israel tax side. Israel will give you a deduction for something for the seven and a half percent. For the seven and a half percent social security to the U.S. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not an expense; it's a deduction. Like they'll give you something off for it. it saves you a little. So you know, this is my information. Uh, everyone's welcome. Uh, email is really the best uh, to reach out to me. Uh, ask any questions you have. Uh, yes? Ellie's right. I've been using it for like 18 plus years, and I didn't file most of this, and I came late because I don't need to know any of it because Ellie's right. I think Siona, <laughs> Siona, I think, was my first ever client. Uh, Before I was called doing my own tax return, I did hers because she was in Israeli visiting New York for a couple years and she just had a W-2 and I did the return by hand. I was just like reading the instructions. I'm like, that. Ah, worst case, I make a mistake. It's just Siona. Siona. Um, <laughs> hey, Siona, do you use his uh, Israeli compatriots to do your Israeli taxes? I do. You do? Um, I don't because I'm not an attorney. Ah, okay, I so. I work for a family member who is not American. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But you use his Israeli counterpart and are you, are you happy and comfortable with them? It is possible, especially if you're if you're not Smai, um, especially if it's like Moshe. In some cases, even though I, I love working with our Israeli accountant, I think I prefer people work with her. I told you to, her, yeah, I tell people to use her first. If you're local and you hear somebody that's local, it sometimes is nice to have your Israeli accountant. Depending on you and your, like how technical you are, there is sometimes something nice about having somebody a bit closer. Some people don't want that. Some people set everything electronic anyways. But sometimes there is, the US tax return is much easier. We talk once a year, um, I mean, maybe twice a year. I file the return. The US, if you're an Oxma E, if you've got a lot of receipts and expenses and changing situations, um, you know, I'm happy to put in touch with the Israeli accountant. You also might want to look for somebody local. Depends how much you have the US. I've never met my accountant. So you're, so you're right, ever. you could be fine. And she yeah. specializes in US tax. So if you. It's more if you just have like a T got my E, like Elon, if I'm guessing from where you've talked, yeah. you have an Osei Marcia yeah, probably, Marcia, yeah. and I would say that your focus, if you're happy with your Israeli account, you just keep using your Israeli accountant because they're dealing with all of your stuff, and then I just need the bottom line and we'll coordinate the I mean, it's for coffee US. in the morning. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, so it's I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say in that situation you need a US, uh, you have to do the coordination. If you have a lot of US investments and you do sometimes the work in the US, then it's a little more valuable to kind of have us doing both. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for coming. And you guys here, any more questions for everyone? Have a great day, everyone. And also, before you go, consider making a donation to the Cup Hardest on our Soul Festival that Tiana uh, didn't know about. Um, Please, say it again. Tiana, you're the Cup Hardest on our Soul Festival. Concert here, children's children's concert, women's concert, men's thing with Soka. Buy a club for us. Thank you all. <laughs> Nothing you say. Right? Thank you. Thank you. No, because the trust. Yeah. Yeah. No.